we need to jump right into Gregory the Great, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So I am so glad that you are here because I've been learning a lot about Gregory the Great and I've got to get it out. So first thing, we just want to set this in context from the past 500 years is what where we have been looking at the fathers of our faith uh, right after Jesus died and was resurrected and ascended at age 33 which would be right around 33 AD plus minus, all the way up until 500 AD is kind of where we've been. What they've been doing is we've also, they've been involved in the Roman Empire at that time. As the church was starting off, the Roman Empire was already doing well. It had grown, plateaued, and split off into two sections. You know, you got the, the Eastern Empire and the Western Empire. And then you had the decline, especially of the Roman or the Western Empire. At this same time, the church is really doing great. It's found a foundation during the Roman Empire's growth and plateau. It was being persecuted, and there were a lot of martyrs. So it was difficult for the church to grow, but God was banding together the, those who were called by his name, who were going to stand for their faith, and this remnant was preserved. So now as the Roman Empire is falling, the church, with its uh, feet on the ground, is able to start growing and being a lot more obvious. They're not persecuted now. Constantine changed that where they're able to be a part of the state. In fact, Constantine gave them some perks like they didn't have to pay taxes <laughs> on certain things. Churches didn't have to. Wouldn't that be great? Or if you gave contributions that you were exempt from other contributions to the state, wouldn't that be great if we could do that here today? Oh, wait, we do that here. Everyone was like, is there something I'm missing? Yeah, we, we do that today, and that really started as a result of Constantine uh, becoming saved and trying to give the, some perks to the church. We are appreciating that today, and so that's a little bit of history that has come to fruition. <clears throat> so the church, just a little bit more of that history, getting set over the long haul. After Jesus died, or I should say just before Jesus died, what did he tell his disciples? I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to take you so that where I am, you may be also, right? So Jesus died, he, then he rose again, he ascended to the Father, and he said, just like I'm leaving, I'm coming back. And they're all like, great, we've got probably a few days, maybe some weeks, we got to go and tell as many people as we can, let's sell all our possessions, let's just give to what people need, make sure everyone's on board, because when Jesus comes back, we want to be ready. And the years ticked on. And ticked on. And after a few generations, they finally decided maybe he didn't mean he's coming right back. And all of this oral tradition, of course, you had the scriptures from Hebrew that had been already translated into Greek, because as each language changes, you have to track uh, the translation so that the new generation can read and understand what God had said in the first place. And so now, um, Greek is phasing out, well, not especially, well, Greek is phasing out for the Western church. The Greek Orthodox church still uses Greek. And so they're translating scriptures into Latin in order to keep the next generation aware of what's going on. Because when I just tell you the stories of faith, which is what they would do, a lot of the details get lost, right? It's like that game you used to play when you were a kid and you would whisper something and it would go around to the other side and they would have a totally different message. So that was unacceptable when you're dealing with such an important information. That is how to have a relationship with the God that created you. Very important not to mess that up for the sake of others. And that's our responsibility to not mess that up, which is probably why a lot of us decide, I'm not going to go and tell people about God because what if I mess it up? Well, the good news is that God gave us the Holy Spirit to equip us not only to understand his word, but also to communicate his word. So don't rely on the paid staff to keep this message going. We need to keep spreading the word. So that was just a little bit extra. So oral tradition was no longer helpful. They needed to change the language, translate the scriptures, and adapt. And that's exactly what the church did. But now the church is like, okay, but he's still going to be coming back soon, right? A few generations later, he still didn't come back. And they're like, well, we need to start organizing the church. We can't just be everyone doing their own thing. This is, might take longer than we thought. So they modeled themselves, the church, after the best model of organization that they had at the time, the Roman government. 
It had already done great. They saw a lot of pros, and so they almost copied it exactly. The Roman government had an emperor, so the church had a pope. And where do we get the word pope? What does it mean? Father. Mark talked about that uh, several weeks ago. He was the father, the pope, the papal, and he was in charge of the church. So then the government had governors that would govern certain groups of people. So the church said, well, hey, why don't we appoint some bishops or overseers? It's a biblical term. And we can allow them to be over certain groups and they can report back to the Pope and we can have this organization. And then we can have priests in the individual churches. There are several bishops over them. So do you see how this organizational tactic is just copying what had worked well that they were familiar with? So just like the Roman Empire, the church split into two sections, the West and the East. And of these, we've been teaching on the church fathers, the patriarchs, or in the Western church, they're also called the doctors of the faith. Now, doctor comes from a a Latin word. Zoom out. Oh, yeah. Latin word, docere. We get our modern day word, doctor. So that's why we call them the church doctors. But it's not doctor in the sense of someone who takes care of your physical body, but a master teacher. That's what decore means is actually teacher. So these are the teachers, and I guess doctors are teachers. They, they do a lot of learning. My sister-in-law is visiting here today and uh, graduated from PA school not too long ago. Did you, was it harder in PA school or was it harder in regular college? I was, uh, I'm going to hear her say PA school. Uh, there's a lot more focus on what has to be learned because I was talking to my young daughter, 12 years old. I said, well, what would happen if a doctor's not trained well? <laughs> Somebody could die. <laughs> So all of a sudden, you're focused on, I need to get this right. It's not like I'm never used math again in my life. I'm not going to really worry about math in high school. You really have to focus. So that's what these guys were the focused patriarchs, the doctors of the church. They focused in in order to make sure they get it right, teach it right, and preserve for the next generation. Very, very important. So Mark has uh, taught already on Ambrose, St. Athanasius, and Augustine couple of lessons on Augustine, and then I taught on John Chrysostom not too long ago, and then today we're hitting Gregory or the Great. We're not going to have time to hit any of these others because we're taking our hiatus. Did I tell you that we're going to kick back church history in 2016? So we're taking a break, going through Greek through the rest of this year, and then we're going to do history, and then Mark, the plan is, Lord willing, that Mark is going to continue the New Testament survey that he stopped before the Context Bible. How many of you want to get to the end of the New Testament finally? Okay, well, stay tuned. Uh, you got about a year. We're going we're gonna to hit that. So just keep coming unless the Lord comes and then you don't have to. He can catch you up on anything you missed in the New Testament. But I wanted to miss in, mention Jerome. He is the one that wrote the, the Vulgate. Are you all familiar with the Vulgate? It's Latin, uh, a Latin term, and it means common. It was the common language written from Greek and Hebrew and even the Greek Septuagint into Latin for the new Western church, which spoke Latin. Again, the Eastern church or Greek Orthodox church continued with Greek. They didn't need a new language. Seemed like the better plan. The Western church wanted to make things difficult, so they translated everything into Latin. And um, Jerome was instrumental in in doing that and making this uh, very famous. I just want to say something real quick since I did take Latin when I was in high school and in college. I was in Latin club in high school. Now, some of you may think I'm just bragging about languages that I took. I'm really not because when you're in the Latin club, there's nothing really to brag about. We were a, a very small, small group. In fact, this was our slogan. The other good thing about Latin, it uses our alphabet. So there's no new letter strike. Can y'all see that? This is parvus sed potens, translated small but powerful. 
We were not powerful, but we needed a slogan to rally behind because we were definitely small. My point is, though, that in Latin, you pronounce the Vs with a W. So back here to the Vulgate, that would really be pronounced Woolgate. It's like that old Woolworth store that some of you may be familiar with, but not that at all. Parwu said potens is, um, so here in Gregory's, if you go back to the PowerPoint, I'm sorry, Jerome, he wrote the no womb testamentum. No womb means the new testamentum, testament, and that is where we get our word testament from the new and the old testament. You also may notice that little Greek symbol that's on the front below where it says New Testament in English, which is a translation. Uh, let me see if I can draw it here if I've got a little bit of room. So some of you Greek scholars, can you tell me what that is? Does anyone recognize that? It's Greek to me. <laughs> Good, yes, that's true. Okay, so this is just a little precursor. I'm getting a little, getting you ramped up for a little bit of Greek, just real quick. This is a chi and a row. It's the first two letters in the Greek word for Christ or Christos. Notice the ending sigma is with an S and the middle S has got a circle with a tail. So Christos, Christos is Christ in Greek and a lot of times they would use Ka or Kairo. They would put that together as an abbreviation for Christ. Does that make sense? So now you can tell everyone you know at least two letters of the Greek alphabet, Cairo, and you can make a little song. Cairo, Cairo, it's off to church I go. There's more to it, but I won't bore you with it. <clears throat> so this is also just worth saying real quick. Have you ever seen this? And people are like, why do they keep Xing out Jesus out of Christmas? The truth is that if they know what they're doing, that's really Christ. That's an abbreviation for Christ. So that literally is Christmas. And Christmas was Christ's mass. So they took off the S, they abbreviated Christ, and there you've got Christmas. It still works. But if you are ever communicating that to a group that does not know that the Chi is short for Christ, then you are Xing out Jesus. So you should not do that. If it's within your own group or perhaps your church, we could all do this and, and be okay with it. So that was just a uh, quick Greek for you guys. Okay, I wanted to mention Basil. Uh, we hadn't had a chance to talk about St. Basil or Gregory Nazanzen, but uh, most of you know that Basil is, is an herb, or some would call it a spice. It's from the mint family. So it should be said that St. Basil is just not meant to be taught about right now. So all that having been said, let's move on to our subject at hand, St. Gregory the Great. He was born around 540 AD, and he was born in Rome, Italy. But when he was growing up and alive, he did not have the moniker the Great, nor was he the saint. That was usually added later. So for us, we're just going to call him Gregory. I heard Kevin calling Kevin. I mean, I, call him, I heard Kevin calling Greg, which I thought was a little informal, we're going to call him Gregory, his uh, given name. I'm just kidding. So Gregory was born, as with a lot of these other guys that we've been talking about, in wealth and resources. Uh, his parents were very well-to-do and gave him uh, properties, education, a great education, in which he eventually majored in law. So once again, just like others that we've talked about, uh, John Chrysostom is an example of one. These, these doctors, one of the reasons that they ended up getting the moniker the great and that they were even sainted, which you had to have a miracle, and we talked about that before. But they were reformers. They were people that just didn't go along with the status quo. You know, hey, I'm the bishop. I'm over these people. The emperor likes me now. He's not trying to kill me. He's invited me to his meal, so I'm going to dress up in my nice bishopric robes. I'm going to go to his uh, big meals, his banquets, and just enjoy myself and, you know, pay attention, make sure the priests aren't burning the churches down, but they became very lax. Every once in a while, God would bring these patriarchal fathers who were wanting to reform seeing where everything had gotten a bit lackadaisical and get back to business. Because it's easy as you're walking down the road and going down your Christian life that you kind of get off a little bit. And that's why God wants you to come to church. 
That's why God wants you to be in a connection group. That's why God wants you to be a part of a group of believers who can disciple you and allow you to be reformed every once in a while to get back on the right track. That's what we should be having done to us and what we should be doing to other people. This is why the church exists. Do you get that? Ephesians chapter 4. The reason we exist is not just to come to hear great sermons that we can make notes and put it in our file cabinets at home. It is to make a difference in our lives in order to reform. So these great orators who become lawyers and then go into ministry, or if you're Mark Lanier, you go into ministry and become a lawyer, but you're still teaching God's word every chance that you get. And I applaud Mark Lanier for not only his great study and his great knowledge, but the way that he always wants to come back to the church to help us be reformed. Amen? A great opportunity that we have and that I have that uh, we have this together. So we have Gregory and his law degree. Um, he grew up in a rough time that the uh, Germanic tribes were coming in and attacking Italy. They just liked to be along the Italian peninsula. They would come in, destroy and displace people for a while until the Italians would come back in and, and push him back out. But for a young man, imagine growing up, it, for uh, the Goths attacked like six times over 20 years during the time that Gregory was growing up. So imagine being a young person in a place where you never know who might be coming across the borders and attacking. This was the same theme that we've heard over and over on most of these patriarchs or these great doctors of the faith. So what does it say to us about how problems affect our lives? What do they make us do? Focus. We don't we don't, we're not able to hang out anymore because we're either being attacked or displaced or the fear of it. And so we become a lot more focused to figure out what do we need to do to take care of business. And usually when problems come along, so the problems in your life are things that we want to pray for, but they're also things that God uses to move you into focus and reform. So Gregory did that. He was responsible. He was smart and organized. And so he became a prefecture of Rome. Uh, one of the highest civil positions that one could hold. And he was like, they need some help. The government needs some help. We keep getting attacked. There's, there's something that I can do with my organizational skills. Uh, he was a brain, probably didn't brag about it, but he was able to get things done. So God allowed him to be used in that capacity. His parents were also of the nobility, of the Roman nobility. But at some point, they came to a Y or cross in the roads, a crossroads, and they left their civil post and went into full-time Christian ministry. What did Gregory do? He did the same thing. He became a monk. His dad died not too long after they went into ministry, and so I guess his ministry was in a higher calling, if you know what I mean. But his mom was there. Gregory would take care of her and his three sisters. They would um, finally the parents had already given all the possessions and things to Gregory and his sisters because the parents were doing full-time ministry. They didn't need things anymore. They didn't need wealth uh, anymore. And so when Gregory then became a monk, he turned all of their properties into monasteries. So basically he gave the land to the church, gave all the money to the um, Roman church, and I guess his sisters became nuns. I'm, I'm real not sure. What happened to them? So he got rid of um, all those things, gave everything away, and I want you to notice how Gregory followed his parents' modeling through his life. As Gregory saw his parents in civil service, he took that opportunity. Probably would not have become a civil servant had his parents not. And then when his parents made the change and went into full-time ministry, it wasn't long that Gregory made the same decision and went into full-time ministry. And just a quick about monks, a quick note about monks. Back then, okay, for us, if we became a monk today, it would be a pretty big departure from the life that we live now, right? Most of us would definitely agree. Back then, becoming a monk was not as bad as it is today. In fact, for some, it, it might have been a step up or maybe just a slight step down. But they had food, they had a congregation, they had groups that were taking care of them. Um, it was Serving, a third of your day was serving, a third of your day was studying, and a third of your day worshiping God. 
Does it get any better than that? I mean, that was your day. It, it was a much easier life, and things were taken care of. There were people telling you what to do and how to do it. So for some, it worked out great. So just a quick monk note for you. Um, it's kind of like Cliff's notes, but it's different. So as, as a monk, Gregory was enjoying life. He, was, he, had found, he had found his thing, his niche in life that uh, God had created him for. And it was become very important for him later on in life. So as we review, let's jump down to the Lombards. That was another group that began invading Italy. Now they were different from the Goths because the Lombards were not trying to hang out in Italy and just displace people. They were pillaging and destroying, decimating the area. They would burn everything as they attacked it, and they just went through to the next city, to the next town, to the next tribe, destroying everything as they went. They were a force to be reckoned with. And at one point, these Lombards came and attacked Monte Cassino. Do y'all remember what monastery was located there? St. Benedict? Yes. Benedict and his Benedictine monks. Remember when Mark taught about that? He talked about the Rule of Benedict. Y'all remember going through? There was a whole list, a long list of, of those. Well, all of the Benedictine monks were displaced because their monastery had been attacked. They ran 40 miles into Rome, and they were knocking on doors looking for a monastery that they could live with since theirs was no longer there. And they came to uh, St. Andrew, which was one of the monasteries that Gregory had uh, built on some of his land, and he was there a monk, and they invited in these Benedictine monks. Well, the Benedictine monks did not bring anything with them. They didn't have time to grab their suitcase and their pillow and their straw mattress, which is what monks usually slept on, but they did bring the rule of Benedict, which exposed Gregory to the rule of Benedict, and it changed his life. And for the next three years at St. Andrew, living amongst the Benedictine monks and their monks. He began to um, live under these rules, just thought it was uh, great, even greater than what he was already enjoying as a monk. So he was there for three years. And then, well, do you remember one of the rules of the rule of Benedict, one of the precepts, is that you have immediate obedience, which is another great thing to model, immediate obedience to the things of God. Gregory's parents modeled things, and he followed them. I wanted to say to you parents, whether your kids are still with you or whether you have adopted spiritual kids that you're mentoring and discipling, these are things that you want to show and model to your kids. This is an example of someone that's following what's been modeled. His parents could have modeled a lot of different things, and Gregory's life could have taken a lot of different turns. A lot of the decisions that your kids make could be a result of the way that you model and teach them. Sometimes I know it's in spite of what you model and teach, but at the very least, as Christians, we're responsible. It's our responsibility to model and to teach our children that God has given us in our small group at home, but then also to have a small group that you're mentoring and discipling. We'll talk more about that as uh, the time comes, but one of the rules was that you have immediate obedience. So if the abbot of the monastery comes and says, jump, you say how high. If the pope comes and says, jump, you just start jumping. The pope came to uh, St. Andrew. He goes to Gregory and says, hey, I want you to be my ambassador in Constantine or in, Constant in Constantinople where Constantine had named the city. Constantinople, that's modern-day Istanbul, if you were wondering there in Turkey. Back then, Constantinople, and it was kind of the seat of power for the Eastern Church. So Gregory went and was the ambassador to the Pope for, for the Western Church to the Western Church, and vice versa. So he went there, uh, did not want to go. He was enjoying his monk's life, but he couldn't complain, he couldn't argue, so he took off. He did a lot of preaching and teaching while he was there. And one of the things he did, he got into a big debate. Remember, he's a lawyer. Got into a big debate with the patriarch of Constantinople, Eutychus, who said that Christ's resurrection was only spiritual. Gregory said, no, because I've read the Bible. And Thomas came and touched Jesus' hands. God put that there so that we would know that Jesus' resurrection from the dead was physical. And that we would have resurrected bodies while living in the New Jerusalem, physical bodies. And so they had this big debate. Finally, uh, Gregory won. 
And the reason we mention this is because I want, Mark and I both, want you to see how things and decisions have been made through the years that we don't have to go back and make those same decisions. We can at least see the direction that the church was going. You still need to study and show yourself approved. But this is how we got to where we are today. It's important to note uh, several debates and discussions. So he finally finished that particular stint in Constantinople. He was able to come back to Rome, and things were not good in Rome. Now, it was no surprise. Um, Gregory was used to things not being great in Rome. But now that he's this um, ambassador, is kind of up in status now, He's already an organizational guy wanting to help and, and lead, lead out. He comes back and he's like, well, we're still being attacked. We still have wars. And you know what? There are rumors of wars. We're having earthquakes. There was a flood that came and flooded all of their granaries, which meant all the food was thrown out. It was spoiled and ruined. So inflation went through the roof. And there was disease. They had the bubonic plague going on. At the time, it ran between 590 and um, I think three or four years after that. It would run through different stints all around the Mediterranean. Started in Egypt, and bubonic plague very easily spread and uh, kept going in waves around the Mediterranean coastal lands. And so Gregory seen all this stuff, and he remembered something that he had read in the Bible. Because, again, Gregory is a student of God's word. So if I flip over here to Mark chapter 13. So I can get it a little closer so you can see it. It says here, And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation, and kingdom will rise up against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. And Gregory took that to mean that the, the end is coming. He said, the sun and the moon, which are some other signs that the end is coming, have not done what they're supposed to do. But judging from the weather, that's probably going to be happening soon. So he was telling everyone, repent, get right, or get left. This is the time. You look at all the stuff that's going on. You see these wars. You see the famine. You see the floods. Things are getting worse, and Jesus is about to come back. Amen. Let me ask you this. Do any of these things sound familiar today? What? What, the whole list? Seriously? Well, what's the deal? Is Jesus coming back now? Maybe. Who, who, who knows? You don't know. But what I can tell you is that this list of catastrophes, Jesus was not saying these are the signs of the end that is coming. In fact, in context, you go back to the verses previous, he's talking about the, the destruction of the Jerusalem temple, which did happen in 70 AD. But all of these things keep happening, and they've been happening. But what did God say to do when these things happen? Not get girded up, ready for the end of the world, sell all your possessions because it's time. That's not what he was trying to do, but he wants to remind you to watch and to pray. These things should remind us to be focused in and reformed on the things of God. And so even though I think Gregory was a little off on his message, he was right on with the spirit of the law, which is exactly what he was expecting for the Lord to be coming back. But in fact, the Lord did not come back uh, physically there. What happened was the plague continued sweeping through. And uh, the plague killed the current pope. So there was a pope opening. Who do you think they thought would make a great pope? Gregory. So a unanimous decision. Gregory was made pope. Did Gregory want to be pope? No. Once again, that's more work. Being an ambassador, that's work. But now I had to do more work. There's a Latin word for leisure living, and it is otium. So I know this is not much Greek today. This is closing out the Western church, so we'll look at Latin. But there's a Latin word, let's see. Otium means 
free living. It would be like the Saturday afternoon when you don't have anything to do, you have no commitments, you're otium, just enjoying yourself. But for Gregory to become Pope, he would have to leave otium and engage in negotium. So in Latin, if you put neg in front of a word, prefix it, it becomes, what's that? What? Yes. <laughs> You're jumping ahead, Carolyn. Give me a break. No, that's okay. She said negotiate. It's where we get our word negotiate because that's business. So otium is free living. Just enjoy. You put a neg in front of it. It's the opposite of free living. That's work, hard work. And for them, it's business. Negotium or negotiate. So he was enjoying oceate, and then he had to negotiate. Not as fun. And I think when you renegotiate is when you retire. I had to do that on uh, a couple of days ago when I had a flat tire. I had to get out my jack and I had to retire my car. <laughs> That's a true story. I didn't just have a flat for y'all. So OTM should not be confused with opium. Okay, free living, not opium, but otium. Here, he would have to get to work. He would have to negotium. And that is exactly what Pope Gregory did. He's not the great yet, but he is Pope Gregory. He had to get to work. And it was really being Pope, was really an opportunity for him to do the things that he had already been seeing, all the ills of society and all the problems that nobody else was taking care of. Finally, he was in a position, the church was in a position, to allow him to make a difference in the world that he was living in to the glory of God. An opportunity that we should all be looking for. But I'm afraid a lot of us are enjoying otium. Are you with me? Being a Christian is not an otium life. It is negotium. That's what we need to be about. And so leisure freedom is lost. The Lombards were still attacking. They were the ones that were just decimating everything. Gregory went to negotiate a deal, literally. He went and he knew that wars had been going on all this, his whole life. What's got to happen to stop this? No one's done anything. So he goes to the leader of the Lombards and he says, and he brings an army with him, because at this time the church had an army. He brought an army and said, look guys, we can fight about this again, or we can work out a deal because we're all sick of this. We want to get on with our life or our otium perhaps. So he negotiated a settlement and the Lombards left, and what Gregory did, pretty much he paid them off. He took some of the money from the church, so the church's bounty became booty, given to the Lombards, and they went on their way and, and left Italy alone for a while. First time that anyone was able to make a difference with all of this attacks there in the uh, Italian peninsula. He was great at administration, so he refinanced, he reworked all of the uh, properties and the money of the Roman Catholic Church, and, and this is the thing that began all of the papal states. He organized the, the, the land, the properties. They had so much because today we give money mostly to the church. Back in those days, they would give huge plots of land or, or maybe part of their crop. That was their tithe to the church. So the church had a ton of properties that they weren't really doing much with. Gregory already knew about how to manage properties from his childhood, taking what God had already blessed him with and allowed him to make a big difference there in the Roman Catholic Church. He was quickly responsive, more so than other popes and bishops especially, to uh, affliction and hunger. He did a bishop reorg. Uh, these guys, again, were lazy. They were enjoying the otium, and they weren't excited about negotium. And so he negotiated with them, gave them extra classes to bring them up to the level of being a bishop and overseer of the church. And the ones that didn't, he fired, and he went out and hired the Rusties, which were, we get our word rustic from, they were the workers out in the field. These were the guys that knew what negotium was. They were workers. He would bring them in, train them up, and they would become bishops, and they were getting the job done. Again, this reform that Gregory instituted. He was big into evangelism. This is the pope that sent the 40 monks, the Benedictine monks, to England to evangelize, that Augustine took those monks. Uh, Gregory is the one that sent that mission trip. Uh, he was big into liturgy. 
which is how they worshipped. He did a big reform on that. You may recognize the term Gregorian chant. Anyone? The soothing sounds of uh, the Gregorian chant. I brought a sample for you. How many of you have fallen asleep? Wake up. What a great life. This was Otium. <laughs> Singing praises to God, enjoying life, studying his scripture. Um, but Gregory is known for bringing this particular style of chant to the church. Uh, there wasn't a lot of harmony during that time. It was all unison, but uh, very soothing. And then they would put a lot of Latin phrases like um, Dominum, Lord, uh, other things. I would, I would do a little bit of... Parvu said potens, which is our Latin slogan. I would throw that in if I was doing a chant. Um, but they would sing about the things of the Lord, which he is not small, but he is certainly powerful. Okay. Oh, yeah, one last thing is, where are we? Health. The other thing that Gregory did is he hit health head on. What was the biggest health problem at the time? I already mentioned it. The plague. Terrible terrible disease, easily transmitted, and people were just dying like crazy. And anyone caring for the dying within the next eight to ten days, they would probably be dead. So how did Gregory attack a physical problem? How should we attack physical problems? Through spiritual means. And prayer was one of the, the best. And so what Gregory did is that he said that one of the symptoms was sneezing, which transmitted the disease. If you saw someone sneeze, you should say a prayer over them and do the sign of the cross. The prayer should be something simple like, God bless you. Have you heard that before? Has anyone prayed a prayer over you and you sneezed? Or were they just saying the thing they had learned a while back? Yeah, probably not. So I want to encourage us all to adapt praying when people sneeze, but really praying for them. If you want to pray in German, my brother-in-law is here today too, Holly's uh, brother. He spent some time in Germany. What does Gesundheit mean? Bless you. Gesund means healthy and Heit means hood. So it's literally healthy hood. So that's German for a prayer that you would be healthy. And then they would do the sign of the cross as they would end a prayer. And that was a serious way. He was telling all of the bishops to tell the people, this is how we're going to combat this disease. He wanted to go a step further. What does he do? Out of the seven churches in Rome, along the seven hills of Rome, he gets together all of the church in each of those separate churches. The church gets to the church, and he tells them, we're all going to pray and march and worship and sing to the center of the city. They would all come from their different churches. They would all walk as long as it took until they got to their central location in an effort to end the plague. And right around 590, which was right when uh, he was bishop, when Gregory was bishop, that was the time that the plague ceased in the Roman area. It might have been because of the prayer. might have been some other things that you want to justify. But as far as I'm concerned, the best way to deal with physical problems is first and foremost with spiritual means. Gregory was very pragmatic. He was a guy that would take what was practical, he would put it into practice. He didn't care what other people thought. He was in a position to be able to do that. You didn't have to like him, but you had to do what he said. And he used his role as a way to model good behavior. He modeled it well. In fact, um, talking about the affliction of the hungry, he would, in, back when he was in a monastery, back before he became the ambassador, he would go out every day and invite 12 homeless people to come to his house, and he would prepare lunch for them. That was his monk-style leisure living. So you still got to work when you're a monk. But he wanted to find ways to minister to people. So how are we going to take the opportunity to look for 12 people that we can minister or serve to, whether you feed them a meal or not, every day? Find 12 people that you can minister to, and you'll see that that takes a lot of work. But maybe if you just took three people or one to minister to every day, 
you're modeling the things that God has told us you're responsible for. This is what you're about. This is why we're teaching church history to see what worked and to continue teaching that to the church, to continue doing those things. Uh, Gregory had a lot of writings, very prolific, wrote more than any other pope before him, and probably for the next 500 or so years after, wrote more. He did this huge commentary on the book of Job. Who's read Job? How many would like to sit down and write a couple of no uh, volumes about Job? Mine might be a pamphlet. Because <laughs> you got the first few chapters, which is pretty exciting. You got the end, which is great. All in the middle, you've got all these discourses and dialogues between Job and his friends and his wife, and it just goes on and on. Well, Gregory drilled down deep, and thankfully, he wrote it all out of this commentary of the book of Job. This was a man who was getting to business. Lord, make me this is another one of his prayers. What great peace there is in a heart that desires nothing of this world. Indeed, if my heart hankers to acquire worldly advantages, it can neither be tranquil nor secure, because it is either seeking to have what it has not, or not to lose what it has. While in adversity, it desires prosperity. In prosperity, it fears adversity. And so it is tossed from one side to the other by these ever fluctuating waves. But if it please you, O God, let my soul be securely attached to a desire for its heavenly homeland, and it will be much less shaken by anxiety over temporal things. When faced with an external disturbance, make it seek refuge in this desire for heaven, as in a most secret hiding place, and be attached to it without being moved, transcending all that is changeable, and in the tranquility of its peace, be both in this world and outside it. Isn't that beautiful? That's one of his prayers. And this is the same kind of writing that he always had. I mean, he was very good with the language, with Latin. He wasn't good in Greek, but he was great with the Latin language. And the sermons that he would preach when, when he was uh, the ambassador, he would preach like every day, preaching and teaching. One of his favorite things to do, and he was very, very good at it. So those are some of the writings. Uh, his thoughts on the Bible, just real quick as we close out here. we got about four minutes. His thoughts on the Bible, they were the Holy Scriptures. They were written by God. All of the Scriptures were written by God. Man was just the pen. And he would get so frustrated whenever people would debate as to, well, did Paul write this letter? Did uh, Job actually write this? It didn't matter. He said, you were arguing over redundancy. All you need to know is that God wrote it all for you to know. It doesn't matter what human pen that he used, although he did think that Job wrote the book of Job, that he penned it out, wrote it out, kind of a psalm of his life. And we talked about that, where you go back and see what God has done in your life through the valleys and the mountaintops. So he, um, that was the pen of the Bible. The pictures, he knew that some people couldn't read. So he wanted to have beautiful pictures of the stories of the Bible so that people who couldn't read could at least come and remember the stories that they have heard and muse over them, thinking about the things of God. And so during, this is the start of the Middle Ages or the Medieval Age or the Dark Ages, whatever you want to call it. This was a time when uh, a lot of the stained glass windows and, and tapestries would be uh, decorated into the... Uh, temples, the chapels, the churches of the time. And this was the reason they were wanting people to be able to reflect on the things of God. So he was always thinking of the lower man, the lesser man, to be able to help bring them in. But he was also teaching and preaching to the, the higher man, the upper man. He thought the Bible was progressive revelation. So it was very pro-rev in the sense that Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, God would reveal himself more and more through that book all the way through the Old Testament, through the prophets, and then as he moved into the New Testament, God would then obviously fulfill more, fill the law full, and then all the way through Mark's, I'm sorry, Paul's epistles, Peter, James's epistles, the letters, and then Revelation, that that was the ultimate revelation. So it started simple in that it, it very purposefully built up with more information, more detail. So as you read the Bible, you should be getting uh, progressively revealed to. 
some examples were in Exodus, but we can't hit those now. He, he did a lot about allegory. In fact, uh, when Ezekiel had the, two, the, the scroll that was written on both sides, which you probably remember Mark talking about scrolls, that you didn't write on scrolls on both sides. But because of his allegorical understanding, Gregory said that the scroll of two sides from Ezekiel was the Old Testament with the basic meaning. And then on the back was the New Testament with the new meaning. So that's how he would, that's how he would teach. Ezekiel also had the, the wheel inside of a wheel. He taught that as that's the Old Testament. And then the New Testament is the wheel inside of the wheel. That brings more meaning to the Old Testament, seated into the Old Testament and revealing what the Old Testament is. So these are the ways that he, that he taught. Maybe not always right on, but still really good stuff. And that piqued the interest of the people that were around. He said the overarching gist of the Bible is love God and love your neighbor. That is the message of love that God wanted everyone to know, and it was seen from the beginning all the way to the end. On the church, he said they're full of a bunch of hypocrites. Do you all believe that? (laughs) What I say if someone says, I don't want to go to church because there's just a bunch of hypocrites there, I say, well, you'll be in good company. So come on, we're all a bunch of hypocrites if it's true. We're a bunch of fallen people striving to do what God's told us to do, not always doing it perfectly. And a lot of times, even when we do what's right, it's not with the right spirit. It's just maybe that's been modeled. Maybe that's what we've learned. Maybe that's what we just went to church and we just heard this great sermon at 930 and they said, this is what Christians do. So I don't believe it. I don't like it but I'm going to do it because I've been taught that's what to do. So his sermons were very practical and uh, always coming back to God. They were, uh, oh, he also had a lot of puns. He was a very punny guy. And so I can appreciate the word warrior of Gregory the Great uh, because I I love a good pun. We don't have time to get into any any Latin puns. I have some for you. I told my wife, I'm not going to tell you any of my jokes because my wife's here today too, normally in the preschool. And so I can't tell you my jokes now either. We don't have time. I know you're laughing because you're sad, but I just want to say real quick, pastoral care. He was very big on pastoral care, which is a huge need in the church. He wrote about 40 different psyches about di- that he would group people into different 40 different groups so that you could preach and teach to them on their level and on their terms. 40 different categories that he would see people in. And if you're in a certain category, I mean, his sermons would have to hit several different categories, but he had a keen understanding of the human psyche, which is what we need to do, but we can't do that on our own. It's the Holy Spirit that needs to teach us so we know what to say and who to say it and how to say it, always speaking the truth in love. So running through quickly our points for home one of the things that we talked about when he was saying though the end of the world is here because we see all the, the floods and the famine, we see the earthquakes. You should always plan for the future, but prepare for the worst, some will say. You always prepare for the worst. If it's better, then you're okay. Prepare for the best, and that is the things of God. When you're preparing your life, you're laying out what you're going to do today, what you're going to do this next month, when you're planning your vacation next summer, remember to keep the spiritual elements within it. Do not separate or negotiate how to keep your spiritual life separate from your regular life. Be reminded to watch and to pray. Second thing, love God and love your neighbor. Enough said. And finally, Gregory saw his role not to teach on doctrine. He did very few sermons on doctrine because at this point, 500 years as the church has struggled and gained momentum, they had pretty much established most of their orthodoxy, most of their tradition, most of where they need to be. So he was teaching on practical ways to live that out, which is what we hear today. We've already established orthodoxy in the Baptist church, much less in Protestant Christianity. Now we're trying to find out what's practical ways that we can live out our life and then to share that with one another. Hebrews 10, 23, 24, 25 says, don't forsake assembling together. Do that. And when you do, encourage one another to love and to good deeds. Encourage one another to live out your Christian life practically. It's not just you do your thing and I hope you're doing yours. We are to encourage one another. That's how God says that he will build his church. So thank you for your kind attention today as we close out church history for a time. 
uh, looking forward to Life Group Greek. Let's pray you out and uh, pray that today you'll have the great opportunity to negotium. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for the way that you love us, the way that you preserved your word that you have taught us, that the patriarchs and the doctors of the past have gone through the difficulty, the persecution. Some of them have died. We still have some of their writings and teachings, but you have continued your scarlet thread of, de- of salvation and redemption to us today, that we can appreciate and stand on some of those legs that they have presented to us, still studying to show ourselves approved. Father, we pray, we beg of you that you would help us to continue to study, to continue to know how to work in your fields that you say are ripe to harvest. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.